Lewis. Welcome to the Centre for the Less Good Idea, and thank you for being here tonight. We are about to go on a kind of reversible journey under the banner of our SO Academy that is led and envisioned by the dearest Athena Mazarakis, who's in the room. And um, this is a series of programs that we call How, Showing the Making. So literally that. But we're delighted tonight to share with you the making and the moments uh, of the head and the load, which is due to open on the 21st of April at the Joburg. The 21st Gatehouse. of April. You don't have your tickets? Move. Um, and the head and the load is a particularly special piece for the center because it was really one of the first moments where not only did we as an organization, as a space dedicated to incubation and cross-disciplinary practice into the collective voice, get to witness William and his collaborators at work, to be in the room where you see this unbelievable unfolding in, where, in which the idea, the artist, the impulse is given the benefit of the doubt. And it's from there that we take our methodologies and our strategies as an organization, pursuing that less good idea, not the bad idea, but the idea that comes after the big idea. So what is also particularly special is that many of the collaborators in this piece are artists who have molded and shaped the center, who William met through the center. So joining us tonight is Nklankla Maklangu, Gregory Ranoma, Klale McKenna, and Tulan Chauke, together with William. And we have the great privilege of watching them describe to us how this form, grammar, language, and um, uh, piece was birthed. Thank you, and afterwards we will have some uh, opportunity for questions. Okay, good stuff. Here we go. Good evening and thank you to collaborators for being here all with us tonight to do it. What we're going to do is describe the, both what the ideas behind the head and the load are and also then the process of making. So we'll go backwards and forwards between the histories and the way in which the performance was arrived at. As um, Bronwyn said, we start our first performances in about two weeks' time on the 21st of April, and then we run for 14 performances. Um, it's fantastic to be doing this here in anticipation of the performance. In March uh, 2020, three, just over three, three months ago, three years ago, uh, we were all set for performing in Johannesburg. We were doing workshops with schools and teachers for the head and the load. And then about two weeks before we were due to start final rehearsals, the lockdown came. And so three years later, it's really fantastic to say, here we are finally. At first we said, well, let's just delay six months. I'm sure the pandemic will be over. <laughs> and they said, okay, we better make it a year. And then, then we understood and said, right, let's not make it two years, let's make it three years. And, and here we are. So. So the background, the background to the piece was an invitation from an institution in New York called the Armory, which is an old military barracks in the center of the city, which has a hall 85 meters long. That's enormously long. It's a huge room. And the invitation from them was do something in our hall. And so the first thought was, how does one do a performance which isn't the size of a normal theater, say 17 meters, but the size of three theaters next to each other? And one of the ideas was, let's find something that has a military resonance. It was a military institution. And at the same time, we'd been working here in Johannesburg on a production of an opera, Albenberg's Wozzeck, which we set as a kind of premonition of the First World War. So we'd been working with many of the performers here in the preparation for that opera, thinking about the First World War and the military. And so when the 
invitation from the armory camp came, in a way we already had a lot of ideas and possibilities together. We'd worked with the sounds of war, the sounds of sirens, uh, the kind of movements that might be in it. But what we then did was shifted from working with the exact script of uh, Buchner's play and the music of Albenberg into saying, let's see what that military means here. So that was the invitation. And what it did is it transformed what is the connection between actors and performers, all of us living in Johannesburg, and that military, but specifically the First World War. So that brings me to the second thing, which was thinking about the subject of the piece, which became about Africa in the First World War. And there are different kinds of ignorance that one has. And the th I realized in myself the ignorance about Africa and the First World War. And there are three kinds. The first, the first is a designed ignorance in the sense that the armies and the institutions in Europe deliberately hid information about the Africans who had been part of the First World War. There were no monuments to them. There was no record of them. There were no lists of names. They were literally erased from history in the most direct physical way. But secondly, so that was an ignorance that kind of most of us had and I, I had. But then there were two other kinds of ignorance. The one was um, being so filled with one idea of the First World War. If we think of the First World War, what's the first thing that comes to mind at the moment? All quiet on the Western Front. The trenches of France and Flanders. You know, German armies on one side, French and English on the other, and the mud of the... That's in the poets, the English poets, that's in the popular histories of the war. But in spite of that, we also in our heads know something about Lawrence of Arabia and wasn't that part of the First World War that wasn't in France. And then I also knew about a, a revolt which had happened in Nyasaland, which is now Malawi, at the time of the First World War, about African soldiers having to go to the First World War. So these were, these were ignorance. This is an ignorance that I should not have had. I should have saying, if you're alive to the world, you should be aware of the way different events have connections to other areas. And the third one, which in a way is the most difficult, was that I did know. I did know about Chalembwe's revolt, and I did know about Lawrence of Arabia, and I did know how the First World War came to Africa, but still I was seduced by the glamour and the stories of the trenches of France. So when we came to think about what the First World War was in Africa, it was almost like a shameful gap that, that we all had to, had to fill. So it wasn't as if we came with knowledge, we came with an absence of knowledge, and the project was partly about uh, filling that. So it's about research, it was about reading, it was about discovering at this time that there were more books being published about Africa in the First World War. And so to give a, a brief uh, synopsis, we know the war between 1914 and 1918 fought largely in Europe between the forces of Germany and Austro-Hungary against France, Britain, and the Russians until the time of the Russian Revolution. But there's another way of understanding the First World War. In 1884, at the Congress of Berlin, there was the final cutting up of Africa between European powers. France and Belgium and other countries had colonies in Africa, but Germany hadn't. And at this conference, it carved out its colonies and all the European countries got their colonies. And when the First World War happened, one of the contestations was about who got which colonies. And the colonies, as we know, were the source of wealth, huge amounts of wealth for, for Europe. So this fight over who gets which colonies was a significant part of the results and of the fighting in Europe, even though most of the soldiers were in Europe. But nonetheless, even though most of the fighting was in Europe, there were, in the end, over a million, over a million casualties in Africa of African soldiers, of African uh, porters, and of African civilians. Most of the Africans who were involved in the war were involved as porters, carrying military equipment from the Cape up to East Africa, where the confrontation with Germany uh, was happening. Senegalese soldiers were able to carry arms and went to fight in France. 
In South Africa, Jan Smuts and others said, absolutely not, could you think of giving a Zulu a gun? They would turn it on the <laughs> white people around, so they were only employed as laborers and as carriers of uh, military equipment in, the, in France, but particularly in Africa. And so as we did this, gradually the piece became about the porters carrying the war on their shoulders, on their shoulders to, to, the, to the front. So you would have military equipment, which would first be sent by train from Cape Town up as far as the train line went. And then it would be pulled on what roads they had by tractors. And then it would be put on beasts of burden. But of course, beasts of burden all were killed by tsetse flies in some of the central parts of Africa. And so it was found the most efficient way was to put cannons, machine guns, rifles on the backs of men carrying it. There was even a ship that was physically dismantled in Cape Town into its many component pieces and physically carried to Lake Tanganyika where it was reassembled and put on the water. So this, was the, this is the background and this is the, uh, the story. Now to the actual making and the people involved. When the, as the theme gradually coalesced, so we started putting together a team of people to, to work on it in Johannesburg. It used designers who I'd worked with on the opera, on the Wozzeck Opera, a lighting designer, set designer, costume designer, um, who came and joined the team. Uh, Philip Miller, who I'd worked with on other projects, came in as a composer. He invited Tatuka Sabisi to work with him. I'd worked with Gregory and seen Gregory's work, no, I'd seen Gregory's work more than me being in his dances. Um, but invited him to join the project. Specifically, and we'll come to that almost right away, I'd seen in a performance you'd done, doing, Gregory doing extraordinary things of contracting and relaxing his chest in some movement. <laughs> and I thought, okay, there's something in that that feels military, but is more than military, or is different. And when Gregory came, I said, that's one of the things I want you to think about. And Tlantru Mashlango, who'd worked with us on, um, on other projects here at the center, said, come in as a performer, but gradually became also composer and choreographer and many other things involved with the project. Uh, Tulani had worked with Gregory at the center and had seen fantastic dance, so he came in very strongly as one of the dancers. And clearly, we have a long association with many different projects over the years. And uh, Philip and the whole musical team definitely said he was an essential part. So the team was assembled and um, in my studio here, which is 20 meters away from where we are, we had a series, we had I think two big workshops. And at the workshops, and that's what we'll really be showing this evening, a theme would be announced and we'd, or an idea would come and then would be a process of improvisation, rehearsal, testing, seeing how things work. And from that, ideas coalesce. So maybe, Gregory, this is a good time for you to talk about that first impulse, which I identified just as a kind of movement <laughs> in, your, in your chest. <laughs> and we can go from oh, there. I hope I can do it better. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, he, well, he could not do it worse. <laughs> Well, thank you for inviting me. Of course, I think you know sharing the process. It's always one of those um, humbling things because you get to see the finished product, and you never get to see what yeah what's the process of us getting you know where we should where where I mean us getting to where to a point where to to present the work that you you'll be seeing. Um, firstly, I think you know I want to tap into what you spoke about in the beginning, the absence of knowledge. And one of the things that I was thinking about when um, William first invited me into the work and we spoke quite a lot about the spasm in the body, of which is what he was talking about. Like the body gets to a point where it no longer in control, but it's the spasm that exists inside the body that takes on the control. And I was thinking about if the recruits, the new recruits, who have no idea and have the absence of knowledge of 
what it means to be a soldier, what it means to go into a military force and to learn how to salute, and at the same time, you're listening to the orders that are coming from different directions. That kind of confusion leads to the kind of the spasm that you we were talking about. Let's just so move let's some maybe shares. demonstrate that. Okay, maybe with Tulan. And Jana, I'm sorry, I said we'd do shadows, but we'll do the uh, orders and commands, maybe, if you can find that. So afterwards. imagine there's so many uh, orders happening, and this soldier is the new recruit. Sorry? No, no, I want you to do it to find the reference in performance afterwards of orders and commands. Yeah. Okay, but let's start. No, but we start just with Gregory. Okay. So the starting point was seeing what was coming from Gregory. What that then puts one in mind of, and she then pursued further, is the question, as you describe it, of the spasm. So it's both a spasm of the body, but it's also a spasm of history. And the, the spasm of history has to do with the fact that in Africa, you had this paradox of some African leaders saying, why should we go to war? This is not our war, this is a war of Europeans. Let rich man bankers go to war and get shot. Why should the Africans who in death leave only a long line of widows and orphans go and take part in the fight? So you had that sense, and that was one of the revolts against the English was in, my, in Nyasaland, in Malawi, against going to war. On the other hand, you had French leaders, African leaders, saying, because uh, initially France would say, we want no African soldiers. This is our war. We don't want you to come and take part. And they, in the French parliament and from Senegal, were saying, we demand the right to take part in the war. As, they, as one of the leaders put it in his letter to the press, we offer a harvest of devotion. Oh. So, I mean, that's one of the phrases that stuck in our head, this harvest. Yeah. So you had on the one hand saying, why should we go to war? And the other one said, we want to go to war. And so in a way that came out of that marching and not marching, being stuck in this, are we going to be part of Europe and welcomed into Europe? I mean, a lot of the people, Africans who went to war, did it on the basis that they would show there they were the equal of the Europeans and were as dedicated to that country, so should be given civil rights. So they expected civil rights, but at the end of the war, what did the soldiers get? A great coat and a bicycle. Um, so that was, that's, that's something which starts almost as a physical thing, but which has echoes into the meaning of the piece and into the way in which we kept going. Um, Jana, maybe just show us a tiny clip of how that was in performance. Of the orders and commands still. You must, uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Bam, bim, bim. Bam, bim, bim. Bam, bim, bim. Bam, bim, bim. Bam, 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 bam.
Okay, just pause it there, Jana. So one of the things to talk about that uh, in the staging, we had a stage that's 50 meters long, which we'll have also in Johannesburg in the theater at the Nelson Mandela Theater, 50 meter long, which means if you're at one end of the stage, people are far away. It's like watching a cricket match from the stadium to the center of the pitch. Um, but we were working also with the idea of shadows which get projected. So maybe this is in time to switch to the shadow screen to demonstrate how the shadows worked. Uh, we can, Vangani, we can open your one. Yeah, so let's just shift these to the side. So you can see if you are close to the screen, your shadow is your same size. But as you approach the source of light, so which is kind of obvious, the shadow grows and grows, so that in the audience you have a sense of a small performer, but a shadow that can be as, should be even larger if one didn't fall over the edge. Um, and so one of the languages we had to play with was what is it to move, not just sideways, but also forwards and backwards. And in the workshop, one of the, one of the tasks is always to learn the grammar of what you have discovered. So we had a projector, we knew we would get bigger when we got to it, but what are the rules of that game? How quickly do you move forward? How can you sustain that sense? How do you play with the, uh, with the change of scale? As apart from the questions of the projection, this is a projection from towards the end where we have an imagined list of the dead whose names were never, whose names were never recorded. Um, so one of the things we had was how do we show in the war uh, that sense of movement and energy and action. And there was a scene which was developed again by Gregory Antulani of running. So running on the spot, but appearing to get further or closer depending on your place in the shadow. So maybe we come across and you can... Uh, can you see the white line at the front? Yes. Definitely. So please don't fall off the, off the edge. Running and falling. Okay. So, and then you're going to go up this one, yeah. Get Cover the and Jana, if you show a bit of the performance just to get a sense of how that. Yeah. We'll get you. <laughs> Okay. 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 You get a sense of how the how that how that works. Um, so it's a question of within the given, which was the presence of a projector that we could put on the floor to throw a shadow. What does that suggest? And the running came out of that suggestion, and then the music came. Out, what do we find to put with the with the music? Um, so let's talk a little bit about the language in the in the piece. So at the time of the First World War, you had in Europe the Dadaist movement, 
Flor in Zurich in 1916, the anti-art, absurdist art movement, a lot of which had to do with poetry and with poetry without language, in words that didn't make sense. And this was because for those artists in the midst of that mayhem, of that carnage all around, in, all around them, was a sense of saying it was the good logic of Europe that had produced this catastrophe. And if that's what the good logic produces, let's try <coughs> to demonstrate a different logic. So instead of having a poem, a line of poem that made complete sense, you would have a line of poetry that did, that did not make sense to demonstrate the the impossibility. Of course, you also had the, the other languages not making sense. When, when Europe was dividing up Africa in 1884, the Congress of Conference of Berlin, the Berlin Conference, there was no sense of them listening to any words or their words having an impact on people in Africa. The Africans were not consulted. It was simply languages happening outside. And in the same way, when Ch John Chalembui wrote his letter in Nyasaland in Malawi, protesting against the use of Africans in the war, that letter was just ignored. It was suppressed, it wasn't published, it couldn't be heard. Those words could not be heard. So we play with many different languages in the piece. There's sections of Morse code in Swahili and Hungarian. <coughs> the manifestos of the Dadaist are translated into Saswati. But there's also a scene in which the generals or the officers who are deciding how to cut up Africa also speak in a nonsense language based on, based on the, um, the nonsense Ursonata language of Kurt Schwitters, one of the Dadas, in a poem. So maybe we, okay, I, I don't perform this, and Santla performs it with two actors who aren't here, so he's gonna have to prompt me. He does. But not in this, <laughs> but, not, but not in this cut up form, not in this way. Okay, so it's like two generals talking to each other. The desert in her ear and puff till two till you car. Oh, the rbi biba. Fums povata. 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 Poverotata, <laughs> So that was one way of thinking about language. The language of Chalembui's letter, as I described to you, is, uh, is another. This is a letter which he wrote when they started recruiting or start impressing African peasants to be carriers into the war. And it was the letter he wrote entitled, The Voice of the African Native in the Present War. And we asked the honorable government of our country, which is known as Nyasaland, will there be any good prospect for the Africans after this great war is ended? And then goes on to say, you know, in times of peace, everything for Europeans only. But in times of war, it is found that we are needed to shed our blood in equality. And then he said, if this is a war for government game of riches, then let the rich men, the title men, the shopkeepers go to war and get shot and leave the Africans out of it. So that was that was another kind of language that was in it. But then we also took things which were familiar and said, can these be made unfamiliar? So I see in our audience we have Lindo. Uh, yeah, I'm going to ask you to come up. Um, 
One of the things we took, okay, so if you think of what is the most English and First World War kind of song, God Save the, God Save the King. And I know that when you do it on stage, you have like eight other singers yes. with you <laughs> and hear you on your own, but maybe... And don't try. And don't try and don't try and So if, <laughs> if maybe we take say, the first normal unchanged verse okay. and then the ways in which the God Save, God Save, all the different, or what, all the different parts as you like them. Okay. It's a hard one. I'm sorry to put you to. He thought he was coming to watch. Okay. Hey, Lindo, I'm here. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> God save our gracious King, long live our noble King. God save the King. God save 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 the King. God save God save God save God save. That he, God save that he, God save our gracious king, long live our noble Who is the king? king, God save the We wanted to see how does one get out of politeness of singing into, into, into something that has something of a madness and the frenzy of the actual um, fighting. So we knew that you would come through in many places, so that's one kind of <laughs> one example. Good. So that's one kind of sound. Then another one again, which we'll just show you on video because we don't have the performer here so everybody can get their breath back. Um, Joanna Dudley, a particular performer who does extraordinary things with her voice as part of the workshop. And we, I know kind of the range of what she can do with her voice. And we said, okay, maybe she's going to be like a news reporter going around the front line writing reports about what she'll be doing. So we had her in different costumes, trying her out as a reporter. And uh, paper dress, we weren't sure if she was going to be a, a sort of a torch singer from the 1920s and a cabaret singer. And eventually we cut a little eagle out and she had a little black paper cap. And as soon as she had the black paper cap, she started thinking of herself and seeing herself as, we also gave her a big black moustache. Um, like the Kaiser, you know, the Kaiser's moustache. And in fact, the Kaiser's moustache was the basis for one of the songs in the piece. Uh, he was known, and I'm not sure in which African language, as the man with a cat on his mouth because of his <laughs> big moustache. So, um, but we gave her a paper moustache and this thing, and she became the Kaiser and then started working out another kind of Ursamata strange language of this. So she's not with us, but we can show, can we show some of the kind, I don't know if you've got any in the workshop. And, and the like West, 
So this was this was in the workshop. This is the pause for one second. So this is this is like an earlier stage where we're trying to see how does the marching happen. You know, from this we eventually got to the scene that we saw with uh, with Gregory. But this is so a lot of the improvisations start quite loosely and openly, and we see what where they go, and that means that what you're looking for is not so much knowledge as the capacity for recognition. When suddenly something comes towards you and you feel it in your oh, this is this is interesting, this suggests something, and that's then what you kind of pursue. So when Bron was talking about the less good idea, that's what we mean by a kind of the less good idea. Just not the first idea, but what emerges while while working. So we just watch a bit of the Okay, it gives a, a sense of, I mean, the, so it's also one of the things that is important to understand about the center, but the process of working is that the space where you're working has to be a really safe space for stupidity. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're worried about, am I looking like an idiot here, then you shouldn't be near there because everybody's going to look like an idiot at some point in the process, and that's not the, it's a bit like psychoanalysis where you can say whatever comes into your head if the analysis is going to work and it's a safe space to give the impulse the benefit of the doubt and to see what we learn from it. It's also interesting, re-looking at all the workshop pieces, there are a million things in them that I think, oh, okay, we could keep, remember that for the next project, or that could have been in, that could, like picking up Joe with the black mask on was kind, yeah. of, kind of great. Okay, so that's another kind of language that we, that we have. Um, then we came to, in terms of the research, it's a process of research also. We, once we were underway, everybody's invited to read, to come with things, to, uh, to have new ideas for what could come in, and they all get tested and seen. So maybe, uh, Nflanta, seeing this was your, you brought it to the project, uh, the idea of the, the Perdi dance, sure. to talk it through, and then we can show uh, and see some. There is something. I mean, today, when we were working on the great yes and the great no, we were talking about um, how words become the words in a particular language. And we were talking about the word umlun or the hoa. What, what, why did Batswana ended up calling umlun the hoa? And then Kale had an analysis of where that came from. And, and how, where did that word come from? Umlum. It came from Umlum, be from the, the Zulu language. And, and, and there, there, there are some things that we, we, we carry today as our language and our culture, but actually, in actual fact, they sit as a colonial response. And, and we were responding to something, a tragedy. And then we 
had a certain practice or a certain name, and then we then call it our culture, and then, but it's actually in the, in the fact that it's not. For an example, Babedi, uh, when they apologize, I apologize with a stick and a jacket. And because a stick and a jacket is the biggest thing you can give an old man. So it's a bigger symbol of honor that with a stick and a jacket, please, can I go to a club tonight, Daddy? <laughs> so with a stick and a jacket, I'm sorry. And where does that come from? William spoke about what happened at the end of the war when all the, gen the white generals got retirement packages, land, farms, and all the, you know, great uh, uh, reward for, be for participating in the war. And the black men who fought in the war or who were the carriers, we all know the story of them getting bicycles and the coats. And all these men wore their coats with so much pride to say, look at Ubabu Masel where he fought in the war and he's wear he wears this coat and he wears it every day so that because you come back from the war, maybe you, were, you learn how to drive the you have a new skill, you come back, but there's no car to drive, there's no road. And, but all you have is the jacket. And what is it that, you, that keeps you alive? And what is it that maintains your dignity? But these jackets, obviously, they wear off. Iapel. And also the owner of the jacket dies. And the son wears the jacket because he just never who wore it in the war. It's become this symbol of honor in the family. And this jacket is being passed from family and to generation to generation, and it deteriorates. And as it deteriorates, and the jackets disappear. And there was this crisis of like, where is the jacket? Now there's no jacket to walk around and show off. And today, when somebody is wearing beautiful new clothes, on a Sunday and swanking, but you are Jewish. Jewish, it's called a Jewish. <laughs> so, because of the Jewish tailors who were making these jackets, so, so I'm wearing my Jewish tailored jacket. And to say I'm wearing a Jewish tailored jacket is just too much of a long way. I'm, I'm Jewish, I'm going, Jewish, <laughs> and, and the, we have a word called a Jewish which comes from a Jewish tailored outfit. So these outfits were now sold, but they were so expensive that men could not afford them. So how do you get a jacket if you can't afford it and you didn't go to the war and you want to that symbol? So if you have a daughter, you say, oh, I'm going <laughs> And your office is why nobody in the ears them shine. From in our, in our culture, Uma <laughs> Ushada, the bride buys a jacket for the father of the groom, and the groom buys a coat for the father of the of. And but you are, you see, well, this is our culture, and that that's that's that this exchange of the coat. And then we carry it so much with pride that as our culture, and, 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 and it is a colonial response, and it came from the catastrophe and the sorrow that came from the First World War. And, uh, and you're protecting your knee, but we need to get to the pedi dance, <laughs> as, as would be with the jacket. Oh, I need to go to the pedi dance. Yeah, 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 that's what we, that's what we had to describe. <laughs> so, so, and if you look at uh, most of the people in the military, and every time in Johannesburg when we tease the police, we call them Mowarra. And there's a lot of petty connotations with the police and the military. And also you look at the ZCC church and the way they dress and the way they march. It's there's something about the great grandfathers who fought in the war who learned to march like the generals. And they come back from the war, those who survived, and they are marching through the village, excited that we are back and we survive. As they march, 
they are being welcomed by their community with the traditional dance, Yamapedi. You can see this military, this is my grand, this is my uncle. He's dancing in a strange way and I'm welcoming him. I'm dancing in a strange way. There was this match thing of Bapedi doing a military march and traditional pedi dancing. And then I brought that notion back. They call it the Drupa. And on the day that they came back from the war, it was the 31st of December, and it is being celebrated every year where Bapedi, they go to the Drupa on the 31st of December, and you see a cacophony of pedi dance and military marching, and also the crossing of the costume. And that is even more prominent in the ZCC church. Right. Yeah, so let's. I'm not demonstrating. You're not demonstrating because <laughs> he's got a damaged knee and he needs it repaired for two weeks' time. But. Um... <laughs> show a clip of that from the performance to see how it is with the shadows with the yeah. So you can see, just to freeze it there for a moment, the, the costumes were paper skirts which had been made initially for some of the other characters, but when Spanta introduced the Peri dance to us, a lot of the uh, people doing the dance would be wearing kilts. The men would be wearing kilts like the Scottish soldiers from the Scottish regiments. Mm -hmm. And so that sense of the military jacket and the skirt, it's not a literal version of it, but it's the way it gets transferred. Mm -hmm. Then we. We come to a section which um, was like, in a way, the heart of the piece. So we had, we gathered many different possible scenes and possible images, the marching, the ursanata, the orders and commands, the, the emperor, the kaiser. Um, and then there was a piece which started with an, an improvisation, I think it was with the three of you. Um, and it was a kind of a dance the dance of the three men, it's partly military. And then we said, okay, that's interesting, but let's see if we take the dance out of it. So we just have the movement. So maybe we show a fragment of that and then we can see some on the screen. Cool. Um, so Jeanne, if you can play the music for the wounded man dance, but not show the videos that we can, and you can join in and you can join in if you, Want to, but we'll use the yes. sound there. It's hard without it. Yeah. Oh.
Thank you. So when we, when we saw that, when that emerged on stage in front of us, and then gradually getting refined to that simplicity, um, we kind of knew we had an emotional heart of the piece. That kind of, without having a text or an argument, became, as it were, the summation of where we've been going in the, in the project. Mm. Um, but also to reduce it to yeah. a space yeah. where an audience can have one focal point. Because, I mean, as you can see with the images, that everything is so grand. And this is came down to just the heart of the piece. Would you like that to call it distilling? Distilling yeah. the, yeah. The, the movement. Taking all the fluff out. Then it remain just what it's, it's not about how you move, but it's what moves you. But also, I mean, to, yeah, you can just let that run while you talk. Um, it's, it's very simple in instruction. It's a person falling and not being allowed to die. Told he has to get up. But, and because it's done like this, you're unaware of the extraordinary athleticism needed to hold, to support your legs in that position of extreme stress and to be doing the catching just at the right moment. Okay, that gives you a... So I think what, what I'd like to do now is to say, you know, th those gives you some sense of the languages and the processes of, of making, but then to take some questions. Now, I know there are a couple of journalists here who wanted to ask some specific questions. If there are, we can start with those, but then go to more general questions. And if there are appropriate pieces of video or other things to demonstrate, we can do that. But let's move into this next section of the, of the evening. Yes? Not a journalist. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> uh, so you performed this uh, piece in, in, in many places, in some places. Uh, th does this feel like a homecoming for the yes. piece? Yes. I mean, for me, yes. And for... Oh, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean... I mean, when you see the end of the piece, because it's, you hear the names being called of the soldiers. It's so wonderful to call, I think it would be a very different experience for us to call those names in this continent. Yeah. Wow. Mm. Yeah. I think so. I think, I mean, it's going to be very interesting to see in terms of an audience, which things get a different response to what mm. we've had. And, going to be very exciting, I think. But it does feel, I mean, you've been waiting to do this for three years, and it was always an essential part of the project that by hook or by crook we would be able to. And so there, I mean, there are a lot of very generous benefactors in South Africa and from other parts of the world that have made this possible, because as you can imagine, the number of performers, the scale of it, uh, it doesn't pay its own way. Yeah. Yes. One, two. Well, I mean, this is just generally uh, to anyone, but, but William in particular, uh, from the process point of view that, that everyone has gone through um, in the piece, which you've demonstrated tonight, there's a lot of um, uh, kind of tension between the, the trauma of the history and the, context, the historical context that you're working with and uh, the response to that being um, 
almost a, a destruction of sense, uh, a kind of chaotic and um, not nonsensical, but, but using that as a kind of symptomatic weapon against the, the kind of repressive nature of, uh, first of all, the colonial uh, history of it, and then, and then the war itself, and the, and the place of the African porters in the war. Um, and, and this is kind of a, a thread um, in, a, in a lot of your work, um, but obviously it is a very definite approach in the process here. Can you talk a little bit more about that? And, you know, it reference, if you can, your, your allusion to psychoanalysis in the, the construction of the, the center's um, ethos itself. Well, so the question is, how does one deal with language? Where does language make sense and where does it obfuscate the world? Where is it? And so we end with... Uh, trying to say, well, how does one tie the language very precisely? We've had so many scenes in which language flies away from the, from the world, like the Ursonata and in the Kaiser's speech and things like that. And there was a book I'd read by, um, of course, her name's gone out of my head, the Russian Nobel Prize, uh, Literature Prize winner, um, who does oral histories of people. And then there was a book about the war in Af the Soviet war in Afghanistan in the 1980s. And in it, she has a short section which is, uh, the young boy, she writes, took a long time to die. And while he was dying, he looked around and said the words of everything that came to his eyes, sky, mountain, uh, river, bird, and um, in a way, that was a rebuke to all the games with languages that could be played. Language where it is so fundamental and basic and is just naming the things it seems. So that's kind of almost the last words of the, and then there's the list of, maybe we can play that, I mean, so I took that, that sentence from her and that becomes the section. Maybe just play the very end. So it's, it comes back that way, but it, is posed as a big question. As we know in the world today, the news reports, who's saying what about the war in yeah. Ukraine? How, which, which piece of language can one trust and which piece of language is obscuring what is happening? And so the most we can do is place it as a very big question without having a clear answer. And the same way I would say in a way with the, doesn't mean that we shy away from what are the impulses or questions or what does one feel one's driven towards or away, but the question has to stay open-ended, I think. Uh, maybe just show a little bit of the... the <laughs> a young boy took a long time to die. He lay there like a child who has just learned how to talk, repeating the names of things his eyes ever came across. Mountain, sky, tree, the list of the dead. Bird. Kiel boy di noke. Ever sick. Salif beye. Biscuit. Mama diagne from Dakar. Forest. William Di Tepo, nephew, Sospen Mwake, Osman Diagne, Daniel Makadi, Blanket, Omar Diahati, yeah. Mama Dio from Kabul. Okay, so that was, okay, it gives a sense of the, of a way it goes towards a name and an object. Okay, yes. Double sided, double edged question. You started this before the Ukraine war began, but all art, I don't know if you would, all art is about the present day in the sense of you looking back on 100 years. So in the sense, was it prescient? And how does what you're speaking of now in the head and the load pertain to where we are at the moment as a country in Africa with the war in Ukraine? If you see what I'm saying, how do you connect those pieces? Well, Thanks. obviously it was made before in the same way that 
Waiting for the Sybil was made before the pandemic, but talks about a lot of the questions that were in. For me, I was interested in the war as a kind of pressure cooker for all the questions around colonialism. The question of, should we go to the war, not go to the war? It's a question of, should we see ourselves as joining the European conversation, or should we try to keep ourselves away? What is our impulse towards and away? And so it was, you know, somebody said to us, I think we were doing it in Germany. We've done it in about four cities before Johannesburg. And they said, this is the strongest anti-war play I've ever seen. And we were all a bit astonished because we said, well, never once in all the work we were doing mm. was the term anti-war ever mentioned. Mm -hmm. It was like taken as a fact, this war, mm. and what could we learn, what could we see from it. So it's, I'm sure when you see it now, you can't but have the associations that are floating in our heads. Mm. And I'm interested to see what it feels like because we haven't really, we, we did perform it in the United States a few months ago. And I have, yeah. I have a just a response to your question um, that it's 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 a, it's 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 a it's an artwork about the war 100 years ago and later there's a war in Ukraine but uh, and, and the, what what does it mean today like uh, I, I, I don't know if I'm answering or I'm just responding to that question what evolved in me when living in South Africa and growing up in a place where there was war when 90,000 people died when I was in my youth. And today, when you look at the South African statistics of the violent crimes, the xenophobic attacks, the, the, the service delivery protests, and if you, you count the people who are dying today as we're sitting in these chairs, we do not even realize that we are in a war in this country, in the worst war that we've ever experienced. Good. Yes. Hi. I was wondering, could you please talk a bit about the title? The, uh, the title, the, the Head and the Load. The Head and the Load is um, the first half of a Ghanaian proverb, and the full proverb is the head and the load are the troubles of the neck. It was a proverb I'd come across years ago and had written it down together with the other proverbs which are recited at the end. God's opinion is, known, un, is unknown. The pool ahead is not to be trusted. He eats his grain with a thorn. Um, and so the head and the load are the troubles of the neck, which is to say that the burden people bear is both, in this case, a physical burden, an object that they are carrying on their shoulders, it's also a kind of a burden of history, of carrying history along. Mm -hmm. And it's also a kind of psychic burden when we spoke of mm -hmm. that weight of the head of going, not going. So, but the literal origin of it is this proverb. Thank you. Um, how much of your previous work finds its way into this uh, particular work? I mean, different things. We have a a procession that is in this. Maybe we can put the bottom projector on and Jana have some uh, an image that we can just show the carrying of an object like this. So shadows carrying objects we had done in a procession in Rome on a wall across the Tiber River where we'd had to make things enormous to be seen across the river and these, yeah, these shadows being, yeah, you can, So this was a continuation of work we'd done before. In a way, obviously, there were different heads, different shadows, but the idea of both a load that's also a historical head or a physical load like the box. So there were many, there were many things like this that migrate across, across projects. They all find a slightly different language. Okay, any other? And, and sorry, I, I, I couldn't resist this since I've still got the, will you be performing at the coronation, the piece that we heard? Sorry, the? The coronation. 
the bit that you heard earlier. Oh, oh, God save the king. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yes, the question there. So you mentioned in the beginning that you had a huge space to fill and you were given the daunting task of, of presenting something in that space. Can you talk a little bit about um, how you um, tackled that concept of what to put in the space and could um, performers as well just talk about how you felt in such a big space being visual and your relationship between the space and what you had to perform. Okay, so I'll answer the first part and then you talk about the sensation. Mm -hmm. um, when we did the, as I mentioned when we were holding those, those we'd first done in a project in Rome. And in Rome this was a procession we did with uh, music by uh, Philip Miller and Tutuka Sibisi along the edge of the river and that was a distance of 500 meters. So the stage, in effect, there was 500 meters long. You watched the performance from 100 meters away across the river, and you saw these two different bands of people coming past each other with their shadows. So in that sense, when we were shown 85 meters, we said to everybody, OK, we're doing a miniature. <laughs> because it's not 500 meters, it's less than a fifth. So at first, I thought, OK, well, that's fine. We'll do another procession. And then I realized that you couldn't, however slowly you walked, your procession was not going to take an hour and a half. Mm. to take four minutes. So the processional part of it became seven minutes in the middle of the piece, mm. but not the whole thing. Um, but let's, from you, what it was like on that size. Um, so, and I'll talk about the technical part of it. So, William talks about the grammar of the projector, that when it throws an image, it throws it in the V. And we're using three projectors, and there are three Vs that are happen in, the, in the stage. So in the first V, when you are inside the V, then you, are, you have your sh shadow bigger as you move closer to the projector, and your shadow smaller as you move back. And when you are in between the projectors, you can be a narrator whom we're not seeing the shadow and who's not moving. And there could be static things that are happening in between the projectors. And then, then motion things that are in the project. Maybe put on the, uh, just a projection image. I'll have to, here we are, we're in the projection the whole time. But if I come off the stage, mm -hmm. just to explain what I'm mm -hmm. saying. OK, so I'm in the projection. I'm carrying my shadow. I'm carrying my shadow. But at a certain point, even though I'm still in front of that screen, my shadow has left. So that there's this whole dark area between the projections in which you, there's a performance possible. Yeah. And there's a whole grammar then if you want to move from one to the other, you move slowly through the light and then quickly between the projections. Sorry. To interrupt. Yeah. Gregory. I mean, I mean, the other aspect of it, I mean, without looking at the shadows, is that, I mean, at first I thought 50 meters of stage means that we're going to need a lot of stamina. <laughs> to, to, to move across the stage. But, I mean, there was a, such a clever way of isolating the space as well that there were moments when something that was specific was happening at a certain point, but in relation to that, there was something else that was happening on the other side, but they were all related in a way. So there was a sense of segmenting the space, but still speaking the kind of same language. Mm -hmm. We were still in the same story. So that kind of helped. It eased out my anxiety. <laughs> Good. <laughs> I mean, one of the questions was, if someone's sitting at the one edge, what are they seeing way down there? And what do we have to do here to keep them interested? At first, we thought, OK, we'll have the sound over. If you're sitting there, then those people will hear the sound, people talking. And people over here will miss it, but they'll hear it when people get to them. And that was just intensely frustrating for people sitting here mm -hmm. to know what was being said there. So in fact, this idea of very localized sound had to be, we had to shift our first idea to in fact say yes, even though they're far away. You want, the way in a movie you might see people far away, but you still mm -hmm. yeah. hear it. And it doesn't, really, it doesn't really work to say, oh, but it's not important what they're saying. Mm -hmm. yeah? Because if you can't hear it, how do you know it's not important? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think maybe we take two more questions on this. Yes. Um, I just wanted to ask, 
What I'm quite interested in is the dialogue between the research before the project started. Sorry, sorry? The dialogue between the research before the project started and how the sort of content, content followed form of what's happening on the stage and how the, f the stage kind of influences what you're showing. So was it a continuous dialogue going back to research what was happening during World War I and then back to what's happening on the stage? And yeah. I think at, at a certain point I thought, well, we for an audience to follow it, because it's someone falling and being caught on the stage, it's someone saluting, it's this madman here with his drum going crazy in the, in the stage, what are people going to get apart from chaos? And so I thought we need a lecture. At a certain point, Edis of blessed memory, who has made the piece with us and who's not here to perform it or in Johannesburg, um, would stop and give a lecture, as I did at the beginning, explaining the First World War about the Conference of Berlin, and all of these things. And in fact, it was all the other performers who said, no, have confidence in the form. Mm -hmm. And the test then became, can one do something which still gives a sense of that mm -hmm. history? You come out with a different sense of understanding that world than you had at the beginning, I think, mm -hmm. um, without it being spelled out. You know, we do have a note in the programs to remind people, you know, at my age of 68, the First World War is still very present in my head, but I'm sure there are many, many people who will be in the audience who will say, oh, what, 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 what was the First World War? Even what was the Second World War? <laughs> um, mm -hmm. So there will be a kind of a, a context given in, in the program, but there isn't a lecture in the, in the middle of the piece. Yeah. I mean, and then everything turned out to be poetic in a sense. Yeah. You know, even the projected text was not explaining the piece. In a way, it became poetic in the way it was related to the work itself. I suppose in terms of history, it had an argument to make in that um, history is a kind of collage of different facts, of different pieces of information, of different reports that come, which then get written into a coherent history. And mm -hmm. this one's saying, can one use the form of collage as a way of saying this, in fact, is the way that history is made. Sometimes these pieces are missing, so you still make what you think is a co coherent history, but in fact, there are other things that needed to be yeah. added to it. Yes, How the musical score then put together? The musical score was um, Philip and Tutuka were the uh, composers, and uh, there was obviously extra material that came from other people who did it. But uh, they wrote it all down, and there are many musicians. There's, I think, 12 different musicians, and brass band section, and piano, and string. And so in the end, it's all uh, uh, written down and orchestrated, and they're part. So it can be performed by different musicians. The singing parts are learnt by the singers doing it. But because of the number of musicians, it is a written score. And like something like the Sybil, which is a learnt score, uh, but an, and with an improvised piano part in it, so it's not written as a finished piece of music. But every performance is pretty, they have nuances, mm -hmm. but they're not fundamentally different. Mm -hmm. oh, yes, Bronwyn. I just wanted, is it on? I just wanted to add and say that in this process now, since um, really before the pandemic, the center and the office at Williams International Producers and Williams Studio has also been engaged in a kind of process of bringing this work into its into the classroom, into community theaters as, a, as an approach, both from the subject matter and also from the, from the way in which artists can use each other as resources to invent and to create. And um, what's been really interesting from from PhD classrooms in Paris to community theatres today, where the likes of Bungile Zulu and, and others, uh, Athena, who are key to the work of the centre and particularly the academy, what we keep finding is that students and learners do have a relationship to the war. Um, but what is really poignant is that they have a, a, a real sense of what it is to be muted, ignored, silenced, forgotten. And that this piece hits home every time. 
um, and where a textbook or a, a piece of uh, reading would not. Um, and where it's found, where the, the message is really found each time in the body. And we've been able to extrapolate what we've seen tonight into real lived lessons for the, the many hundreds of children and young people and, and young artists who will have an opportunity over the course of the time that the Head and Load is in Johannesburg to see the piece. But prior to that, they've been workshopped with, and, and the gentlemen on stage, as well as other cast members, are doing that workshopping. Um, and it's, so it's incredible to see how theatre, when taken off the stage, is also such a societal necessity. Mm. Okay. So, there's just, I think we'll stop, but there's just this one phrase which uh, sticks with me always, which was also a kind of a goad. And it was a statement made by one of the colonial officers in uh, response to questions of how will the, what will we do with, uh, at the end of the war, where they had big victory parades for English and French soldiers after the victory. But he wrote in a memorandum with regards to the African soldiers, he said, um, lest their actions merit recognition, their deeds should not be recorded. And in that you have kind of the whole question of what it is to hide a history and to try to record and note those actions. Mm. But thank you very much all for being here this evening and thank you to you. Yes. <laughs> okay. And thank you.